thank you, dear, dear Governor Dukakis, uh, dear Tuan, uh, Mark Rottenberg, a very good friend, uh, distinguished members of the Artificial Intelligence World Society Committee, uh, the Boston Global Forum, uh, dear friends. Uh, thank you for this distinction, uh, which I accept with um, gratitude and humility. I am especially moved to receive it, as you can imagine, from Governor Dukakis, who not only epitomizes public service and leadership in this country, uh, but has also been a source of great pride in his ancestral one. Thank you. Thank you for this high honor. Uh, now, you know, ambassadors, as is well known, are asked to speak about many topics for which they are not experts, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, but uh, in fact, artificial intelligence and human rights in the digital age are two topics that I have followed uh, closely for a uh, very long time. They are a large portion of my current work as European Union Ambassador to the United States. Uh, and long before that, uh, I followed these issues closely as a, a Greek politician and member of the European Parliament. Uh, now, while Vice President of the European Parliament's Civil Liberties Committee, uh, I wrote the very first report on security and privacy in the digital age exactly 11 years ago, when the topic was hardly as hot as it is today. Now, I believe, and I think Mike Dukakis will understand this, that my personal experience of growing up under a dictatorship in Greece endowed me with an acute awareness of the fragility of our open and free societies. Even as a child, I saw firsthand that even strong democracies can fall under authoritarian spells. I remember the dictatorship holding files on different citizens, including my parents, with personal information revealing their political activities and preferences to be used against them or to scare them, frankly, into silence. Now, perhaps this explains best why, when I look at the promise, but also at the challenges uh, posed by digital technologies, I've always been guided by two fundamental principles in politics and now in diplomacy. First, in real democracies, it is the people who should have the power to judge the thoughts and actions of the governments every day and to hold companies to account every day, not governments or companies who are supposed to observe or judge the daily actions or thoughts of their citizens. If the unrestrained use of technology leads to the latter instead of the former, we have flipped democracy on its head. Second, in today's democracies, a big brother will materialize slowly and by stealth, not suddenly in the form of an authoritarian figure who takes away our rights in one fell swoop, if it happens, it will be gradual by a thousand cuts with our own explicit or tacit consent with our complacency. Now, since the early 2000s, an example that illustrated that conundrum was the unfolding mass use of cameras in the streets. What should be their proper use? For regulating traffic? Sounds reasonable. Protecting us from terrorist attacks? Absolutely. But given that by their very nature, they could be used on a 24 hour basis for many more things, identifying perhaps all participants at a protest in case just a few of them turned violent, catching a pickpocket in addition to a terrorist. Well, you see, the question then quickly became, where do democracies draw the line for the use of technology to avoid dangerous slippery slopes? What is necessary, appropriate, proportionate usage who should have access to the data and who should not? Where should such personal data be stored in order to be kept safe? And when should it be permanently deleted? Now, <laughs> you will notice many of these questions, you know, bring yawns to many people. They think that they, they're too technical. But in fact, it is in that detail that lies the heart of democracy and human rights when it comes to the digital age. And of course, soon thereafter, Similar questions started to be raised on the collection and use of citizens' personal data by major uh, private uh, uh, companies and digital platforms. Now, the argument used by some governments and business at the time, the one that most troubled me was, quote, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear, unquote. Some of you may remember this. It troubled me because it in essence encouraged the innocent to offer the consent to their very own unfettered surveillance in the name of catching the few guilty. If successful, it could indeed lead to the gradual and irreversible salami slicing of our rights with our consent. So what I would often answer to the posed pseudo dilemma ab abroad, uh, above is, 
Well, you know, if you have nothing to hide, you don't have a life. Get a life. In Git, we have all thousands elements of our private interactions, relationships, histories, beliefs that we do not want others to be able to have, a, you know, immediate and unfettered access to. Okay, now that was then. The reality today is that we are all thinking about technology, innovation, and privacy quite differently than we did a few years back. We've seen and are seeing more every day that citizens want baseline privacy protections, that the status quo isn't good enough, and that the time is ripe for new actions to improve citizens' rights and trust in technology. In Europe, we have always been forward-leaning when it comes to the protection of privacy, perhaps for historic reasons. Look at the Greek dictatorship. And uh, withstood, frankly, significant criticism for uh, pioneering it in the beginning, not least of all with the General Data Protection Regulation, you may remember. Now, without a doubt, we are a better and stronger union today for the privacy safeguards that we have in place. And we are now committed to seeing that our privacy protection also safeguards innovation and competition because our economies and our societies, uh, frankly, need both. Now, whether you call it artificial intelligence or machine learning, or you know, both in the broader sense, they represent change. And change makes many of us uncomfortable because it creates a new reality, something different from what we have come to know. It is easy, frankly, to fear the unknown. I will not lecture you on the textile revolution or the industrial revolution or the introduction of the automobile. Uh, they represented uh, massive shifts in our technological progress and the economic benefits as well as the social upheaval that accompanied them are well documented. Artificial intelligence is different, however, more complex and far reaching in creating a tool that can make judgments that can decide for us between multiple uh, alternatives. We have introduced uh, a new form of change in our daily lives. Um, it is, um, if you like, a change to the nth power, uh, scaling exponentially in a way that we have not yet experienced. Now, as policymakers, citizens, and consumers, even as ordinary human beings, we must ask ourselves, who do we want to make the rules for tools that are becoming increasingly embedded invisibly in the fabric of our society? How do we ensure that artificial intelligence embedded in the cars we drive, uh, the energy we consume, uh, the health services we receive, the messages we send, uh, the news we read, um, even in the refrigerators uh, that we use uh, is safe? controllable, unbiased, and trustworthy. That AI does not discriminate, is not used to observe and judge, um, uh, to socially score, or to impringe on our human rights. In the final analysis, uh, how do we ensure that AI technologies enhance and protect our freedoms, our well-being, our democracies, our humanity, rather than diminish them? In Europe, we believe that there is a clear interrelation between innovation and fundamental rights, that one can promote the other. We value, we champion, and we thrive from innovation. Last year, as the deadly COVID-19 pandemic spread rapidly across the globe, AI demonstrated its potential to aid humanity by helping to predict the geographical spread of the disease, uh, diagnose the infection through computer tomography scans, uh, and, um, you know, frankly, develop the first vaccines and drugs against the virus that we have today. And European companies and innovators uh, have been at the forefront of every aspect of that effort. Uh, the winner of last year's Future Unicorn Award, presented annually by the European Union to startups with the greatest potential, was awarded to a Danish uh, company, uh, Corti, uh, which uses AI and voice recognition to help doctors predict heart attacks. So clearly, the possibilities and opportunities for AI are immense from turning on uh, wind turbines to produce the clean energy for a green transition uh, to detecting uh, cyber attacks faster than any human being uh, or cancer uh, in uh, mammograms earlier and more reliably perhaps than trained doctors. And we hope that AI will even help us to detect the next infectious outbreak before it becomes a deadly pandemic. Um, we want AI to do all these great things. At the same time, just as in every technological evolution that has come before it, we must prepare for the unexpected. Uh, with the increasing adoption of AI, our rights to privacy, dignity, freedom, equality, and justice are all at stake. These are fundamental to our lives as Europeans, 
and enshrined in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. So it is our aspiration, Governor, to create machines that are able to do more and more of our own thinking, uh, selections and decision making. And if that's our aspiration, we must also take care to ensure that those machines do not make the same mistakes that we humans have been prone to make. One example, the use of facial voice and movement recognition systems in public places. Well, they can help make our lives much more secure. However, they can also allow governments to engage in mass surveillance, social scoring, intimidation and repression, as China has shown in the most cynical and calculated way in Xinjiang. Uh, you want another example? The use of AI in recruitment decisions. Uh, you know, it can be very helpful. However, if a computer compares resumes of senior managers and concludes that being male is a good predictor of success, the data simply reflects bias, a bias within our society, which historically has favored men for leadership positions. We do not want AI to reinforce existing biases by copying and infinitely replicating them. Now, these are just two examples to, that to me at least illustrate why we must not become bystanders to the development and deployment of AI. If we, the major world democracies, do not move to establish a regulatory framework to protect our rights, I dread to think who will. In Europe, we have been thinking about these questions for many years now. We see that technology is an inescapable, necessary and desirable part of our future. But without trust in it, our progress as a society will simply not be sustainable. Now, wearing both my ambassador of the European uh, Union and European citizen hats, I'm immensely proud that the European Commission has just presented a groundbreaking proposal for a regulatory framework on artificial intelligence. It is the first proposal of its kind in the world, and it builds on years of work, analysis, and consultation with citizens academics, social partners, NGOs, businesses, including US businesses, and of course, EU member states. It is not a regulation for regulation's sake. I really want to underline this. It responds to calls for a comprehensive approach across the European Union to protect basic rights, encourage innovation consistent with our values, provide legal certainty to innovative companies, spur technological leadership, and prevent the fragmentation of our European single market. In terms of scope, the draft regulation is actually quite limited. It will introduce a simple classification system with four levels of risk, unacceptable, high, limited, and minimal. Unacceptable, and that's prohibited AI practices, are those which deploy subliminal techniques beyond the human's consciousness, such as toys or equipment used in voice assistance that could lead to dangerous behavior or the exploitation of vulnerabilities of specific groups of persons due to their age, physical or mental disability. And of course, of course, it outlaws, we outlaw the social scoring that we see AI being used at for in some authoritarian countries, including China. Real time remote biometric identification systems used in public spaces are also classified as an acceptable risk with extremely narrow exceptions when strictly necessary. Now, when enacted, the regulation will set binding requirements for a small fraction of so-called high-risk uses of AI, the second category of risk, like uh, credit scoring, uh, sorting software for recruitment, verification of travel documents, uh, robot-assisted surgery, the management of critical infrastructure, uh, such as electricity, or when an AI assists a judiciary authority uh, just to name uh, a few practical examples. Now, the binding requirements ensure that in such cases, high quality data sets are used, risks are adequately managed, documentation and logs are kept, and human oversight is provided for in order to ensure that AI systems are robust, secure, and accurate. In the end of the day, dear friends, the purpose of the regulation is twofold. First of all, to ensure that Europeans can trust what AI has to offer and embrace AI-based solutions with confidence that they are safe. And secondly, to encourage innovation to develop in an ecosystem of trust. As Executive Vice President of the European Commission, Margrethe Verstager put it recently, trust is a must, not a nice to have when it comes to AI. 
Now, as was the case with the General Data Protection Regulation, the Commission's AI proposal will be subject to legislative scrutiny before it can become law in all EU countries. And without a doubt, it will also be a topic of some debate here in the United States as well. And the European Union looks forward to these discussions with the like-minded partners. The governor at the beginning mentioned the importance of international cooperation. And this is precisely the emphasis that we're placing as European Union. And this is because frankly, on the global stage, AI has become an area of strategic importance at the crossroads of geopolitics and security. Having taken this pioneering step with the regulation, the EU will work to deepen partnerships, coalitions and alliances with third countries and with like-minded partners, such as the Michael Dukakis Institute uh, and many others here in this room today to promote trustworthy ethical AI. Exploring a social contract for the AI age, a framework to ensure an AI bill of rights uh, in the digital age is fundamental in international relations today. And in this work, our relationship with the United States is paramount. For Europe, the United States indeed, for all democracies uh, around the world, our shared values make us natural partners in the face of rival systems of digital governance, and together we must rise to the occasion. Now, this is why European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen called for a transatlantic agreement on AI that protects human dignity, individual rights, and democratic principles that can serve as a blueprint for our engagement with the rest of the world and like-minded countries. My hope is that Europe and the US will work more closely together, continuously and at all levels with engineers uh, policymakers, um, thought leaders, civil society, scientists, businesses on both sides of the Atlantic uh, to guide our technological progress and to help us improve, evolve, and become more just, equitable, and free societies. And I hope that all AI students and researchers, innovators, policymakers, business leaders, and others listening uh, to us today will turn this aspiration into a new reality. Dear Governor, dear friends, we have a window of opportunity to act, and we should do so now. During my time as EU Ambassador to the United States, I will do all in my power to bring it about. And once again, please accept my warm gratitude and appreciation for this award. It is a deep, deep honor for me, and I look forward to working with you to make this happen. Thank you.